Good morning, everyone. Looks like we have a bunch more coming in. We'll just give them a minute. Uh, no one's talking yet but me. Can you hear me? Good morning. Good morning. This is Delphilia. I'm Good morning. Good morning. Hello, can anybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. All right, guys, let's go ahead and begin. Welcome to the 2021 statewide provider training. My name is Emily Stahl. I am the customer service supervisor in Bureau of Medicaid Operations. Um, we'll go ahead and begin. There's still a lot of people coming in, but we'll go ahead and start. So the agenda for today will be a general overview of Medicaid. We will be discussing PRISM as well. Uh, some provider enrollment, Medicaid information and resources, med policy, prior authorization, the pharmacy, and last but not least, the Utah Office of Inspector General. A uh, copy was uh, sent out yesterday with your email reminders of this presentation, um, along with the Q&A uh, document. We ask that you uh, mute yourself, and if you could, um, Take yourself off camera as well um, and we'll just go from there uh, so i'd like to present bridget for prism um yep i actually skipped the slide give me one second so the six bureaus that are included in the department of health are medicaid operations managed health care health care policy and authorization and long-term services and support eligibility policy, and financial services. Uh, so I will take uh, the time to hand it over to Bridget for PRISM. Can you hear me? We can hear you, Bridget. Can you hear me? My name is Bridget Conde, and I'm an organizational change management specialist for the director's office at the Department of Health. And we wanted to provide you with a bit of background related to the PRISM project. And whether this information is a refresher or this is a new subject for you all to learn about, a little bit of history is going to help us through the training today. So PRISM is the acronym for Provider Reimbursement Information System for Medicaid. So this is a new system that's going to be completely replacing MMIS. Uh, this has been a multi-year project within the Department of Health. And it's currently scheduled to continue development through early of 2023. We did have a component of PRISM implemented in June of 2020. I'm breaking up. Am I breaking up for everybody? I just saw a note on the text. Okay, it says yes, no. Yes, you are. I am. Okay. All right, hold on a second. Let me see what I can do about that. Is that any better? Is that better? Is this better? That is better. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to be implementing in early 2023. And um, we did implement some changes um, for provider enrollment in June of 29th of 2020. I think you guys to be familiar with using some functionality within PRISM. Next. Next slide, thank you. Um, in early 2023, 
We'll be implementing additional components in PRISM. These are going to include the managed care process, prior authorization, member eligibility, claims adjudication, claims payment, member web portal, and audit studio, which is the name of the fraud and abuse system. Next slide, please. We added some fields to the provide directory for each location. This is really cool, you guys. I hope that you get a chance to go look at it. Um, if you're taking notes right now, write this down, add a tax to your to-do list, go to your earliest opportunity and make any updates to information listed on this slide. If you have more than one location, make sure to update all of your location. It's still breaking up. Okay, just a second. Sorry, hold on. That is a good reminder. We do want everyone else muted so that we don't have other complications. Oh, okay. Can you guys hear me now? Yep. Oh, thank goodness. Woo, sorry. <laughs> All Would right. Would you like so, me to go back? Any slides? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'll ask anybody else. If, I think it was all written down. Okay. Um, okay. So this new provider directory is really cool we hope you guys get a chance to go check it out um we added a few new fields that we want you guys to look at so add on your to-do list of things to do to go to uh, the provider directory to make some updates to make some updates um let's see when you do update make sure that you update each location um not just your main location because we want all of them to be updated and the first field that we added was a public phone number field. It's a great field to add, right? Um, so basically all that that is, is a required field. And it's meant to be the preferred phone number provided to the public for your organization. The next new field is the public email address. And don't worry if you don't have a public facing email address. This is an optional field. So it's fine if you don't add it. But if you do have one, Feel free. Um, next slide, please. We are accepting new clients. Um, I'm sorry, the accepting new clients field, it already exists, but it only existed for individuals and sole proprietor application types. So this field is now open to group practice, facility agency organization, atypical agency, and atypical individual. So when you're in a system, just double check your contact information, make sure that this field is either filled out yes or no, um, otherwise it's gonna display as blank within the directory and we don't want that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a listing of all of the fields. 
that you will need to fill out the new field. And you can get here by going to prism.health.utah.gov to access the provider directory and make any of the necessary changes. Um, just remember that we need it done for every location. Next slide, please. We have comprehensive materials related to PRISM on our website, which can be found at medicaid.utah.gov backslash PRISM. Uh, within that website, you're going to be able to find quarterly MIDs or Medicaid information bulletin articles related to PRISM and the upcoming implementation. And make a note of this website as it's a great place to visit to stay up to date with PRISM news, training, and activities as we get closer to implementation. If you don't have it set as a bookmark yet, we highly recommend it. And if you need to enroll as a Medicaid provider, go ahead and check out the e-learning that's available at medicaid.utah.gov backslash PE dash training. That covers the program update. Sorry about the technical difficulties. Are there any questions about the updates that we just covered? Okay. All right, well, if you think of any, please let us know. And thank you for your time today. I'm gonna to go ahead and hand the presentation over to Tiffany. Thanks guys. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Tiffany Scouten. I'm one of the team leads of the customer service unit here at the Utah Department of Health. I'll be presenting the provider enrollment portion of this. New enrollment. In this section of slides, we show you what you will need to complete a new enrollment for Utah Medicaid. As noted, an application can be started by visiting our website. Next slide. In completing the new enrollment, you must select an enrollment type and an applicant type. If you are an IHS facility, please select FAO. While you are completing your application, always maximize your screen and don't hit the back button. Next slide. Please remember, as you are entering addresses, click Validate Address. When completed, select Finish. Next slide. Complete all required steps and upload the proper credentials. Your application must be completed within 60 days from start or it will be purged. Next slide. Revalidating. All providers are required to revalidate every three to five years, depending on their risk level with CMS. Letters for revalidation will be mailed to the correspondence address 90 days prior to revalidation cycle date. Providers can view their revalidation cycle on the basic information screen. Next slide. Retroactive enrollment. Requesting a retroactive enrollment can be submitted by emailing providerenroll at utah.gov. Please include a detailed justification statement with your request. Next slide. PRISM troubleshooting. We've included several common scenarios to assist in troubleshooting. We cover updating EDI and provider information, uploading documents, reviewing required credentials, defining relationship of owners and managing employees. It is required to complete the final adverse legal action convictions disclosure any time a change is made to the ownership page. Also included is troubleshooting account administrator access. And with that, do we have any questions regarding provider enrollment? Okay, I am going to now move on to the Medicaid information and resources portion. Members are required to present their Medicaid card before each service. It is the provider's responsibility to verify the member eligibility, as well as determining program type, managed care plan, primary insurance, and copay requirements. Eligibility can be verified using Access Now Eligibility Lookup Tool or the ANSI 270-271 report. Next slide. Patient Eligibility Lookup Tool. Accessing the Eligibility Lookup Tool can be done by following these steps on our website. Under the Provider tab, select Patient Eligibility Verification, Eligibility Lookup Tool, Submitting Your Credentials, 
adding the NPI and patient information, which will then bring you to the patient eligibility results screen. Medicaid offers traditional and non-traditional benefits. Each plan has a different scope of services. Please visit our website for more information. Next slide. Um, interpretive services can be obtained by going through the steps listed on these three slides. Next, here we go. Um, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, we already did go over this slide. Medicaid offers traditional and non-traditional benefits. Each plan has a different scope of benefits. Please visit our website for more information. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to introduce managed care. We'll have Jennifer and David who'll be presenting the managed care and behavioral health portion. Good morning. My name is Jennifer Weiser. Um, I am the Medicaid uh, Dental um, and SHIP Program Manager. Um, I'm with the Bureau of Managed Healthcare. Um, I'm also with David Wild, who is um, going to be presenting with me today. Um, and Dave is our Program Manager over the uh, PMHP and Integrated um, Healthcare Contracts. So um, we just wanted to go over um, some information regarding managed care today. Um, managed care, um, it's a healthcare delivery system. Um, and the reason we have managed healthcare is to help organize costs, um, monitor utilization and quality, um, and they provide the benefits and services for many of our members statewide. Um, we do have a managed care program for health, uh, dental, um, and uh, mental health services. Um, our contracts for the Medicaid managed care program um, for our um, ACO contracts, which are our accountable care organizations. Um, we, let's see, can you uh, move to the next slide, please? Thanks. Um, we have uh, the following contracts for our managed care uh, program, Health Choice Utah, Healthy U, uh, Molina Healthcare of Utah, Select Health Community Care. Um, we also have a home program, um, and we have the MCNA Dental and Premier Access Dental Program. Um, so these are this is information um, regarding all of our, our uh, managed care programs, uh, their websites and phone numbers. Next slide. Um, this is our PMHP contract or contact information. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Dave now. Um, and he can uh, go over some of our PMHP uh, information. So for PMHPs, we have 11 PMHPs statewide covering every county except for Wasatch County. Wasatch County is all fee for service as far as behavioral health. There is no PMHP in Wasatch County. So these, this is a small slide, so it's good that they emailed this out. They'll have the contact information um, for all the PMHPs statewide so if you have a member or a patient you'd like to see who is part of a pmhp you'd need to be in network or have some sort of agreement with the pmhp in order to get reimbursed for those services next slide and then i have a couple of behavioral health updates we now have uh, the ability to reimburse for behavioral health crisis receiving centers that started last october i believe we have two or three operating in the states so these are i like to kind of Associate them is kind of like a behavioral health ER. It's a kind of a, a walk-in center where they can triage mental health, behavioral health uh, issues, do some treatment there on site or refer for services. We also now have an 1115 waiver, which allows us to, to have uh, stays in IMDs, which are larger mental health facilities dedicated to just psychiatric care, um, like a larger psychiatric hospital, like, like um, we don't call it you anymore, like the Huntsman Mental Health Institute would be an example of an IMD. With our new waiver, we can have uh, members stay in these facilities for up to 60 days where that was not available before. And then also with the residential treatment centers up to 60 days. So that's nice to be have uh, more options uh, mental health-wise for these uh, members. 
We also have a bundled payment rate now for our mental health residential programs with 16 or fewer beds, which started in April before you they were billing individual services. And now there's actually a bundled rate. So hopefully that will help. And we recently have expanded social detox statewide. We had a pilot project previously with just in Salt Lake County. As of April, that's gone statewide. And then in July, it moved into managed care. So now there's social detox available statewide. And then as far as enrollment, tying back into the PRISM, our case managers and peer support specialists um, now need to upload their certificates into the PRISM system when they enroll. If you are already enrolled, um, you just need to upload it when you, uh, on your next cycle, when you need to renew. If you're a new case manager or peer support specialist, you'll need to update your, or upload your certificate during your enrollment on that last step. And that's it for me. Any questions for managed care? See from Mary Thomas. Mary, if you can email me your um, question and with some more details, we can work work that out. I am my email is DJ Wild, W I L D E at Utah.gov, and I can help with payment issues with the integrated plans. Okay, guys, I am back. Um, let's start off with Medicaid provider manuals. Uh, the Medicaid provider manuals are a great resource for individual provider type information. We encourage you to review and become familiar with our manuals. Next slide. Medicaid information bulletins or MIBs are written to inform providers of any Medicaid program updates. They are released quarterly, but we do have special interim MIBs for out of cycle updates. Next slide. Accessing the provider manuals and MIBs can be done on our website by uh, following these steps. Under the provider tab, select provider resources and information, manuals, Utah provider manual, Medicaid provider manuals, and here you'll find a complete list of all of our manuals. Next slide. You'll also find the Medicaid Information Bulletin under the Provider Resources and Information. Um, and you can go in and select the traditional Medicaid program or archives to find all previous MIBs and current MIBs. Next slide, there we go. Our coverage and reimbursement lookup tool is great for showing detailed information of coverage for procedure codes, date of service, and provider type. Next slide. Accessing our coverage and reimbursement lookup tool can be done in our provider section of our website. Select coverage and reimbursement, coverage and reimbursement lookup tool. And here you'll submit code, provider, and the date of service. Member cost sharing. Some Medicaid members share the cost for certain services. We have a copay chart linked here below. We also have a list on the following slide. The services listed below are exempt from copays. Note, non-emergent use of an emergency room requires a copay. Some groups are also exempt from out-of-pocket costs. Children under 19, individuals receiving hospice care, and qualified Medicare beneficiaries, to name a few. Medicaid members are responsible for certain costs, such as charges during a time of ineligibility, spend down, charges for non-covered services when agreed to private pay in writing with the provider, and co-pays. Next slide. Um, so it looks like we have a question in the chat. Do we want to address that now? Okay, we'll get to your questions here. 
in just a few minutes. Um, so except for cost sharing, charges that are not the responsibility of the member are listed. Some examples are charges in excess of Medicaid maximum allowable, a claim or portion of a claim that is denied for lack of medical necessity, and a claim denied due to provider error. Next slide, please. Billing Medicaid members. Medicaid payments are considered payment in full. Medicaid members may be billed for co-pays and co-insurance and even broken appointments when the provider has a policy in place to bill for broken appointments for all patients. As stated before, a member can be billed for non-covered charges when all four of the following conditions are met. This information can be located via our website in our Section 1 Manual, Chapter 7. And here is an example of our financial agreement form that located in our form section. Billing for emergency services provided to a non-citizen. Our emergency only program has a very restricted scopes of services. Once a claim has been submitted to Medicaid, it will be denied for needing medical records. You'll need to submit the emergency services documentation submission form along with the medical records. If it is denied for not meeting policy criteria, the individual can then be billed. Coordination of benefits. Provider must bill all other liable parties prior to billing Medicaid. Claims denied from Medicare as non-covered services should be submitted to Medicaid as fee for service. Include line level payments in addition to claim level data to Medicaid. Medicaid is the payer of last resort. We have provided the electronic mailbox submission payer IDs below, as well as the fax number to submit primary payer EOBs using our documentation submission form. Next slide. Void and replacement claims. Providers shouldn't submit their own corrections to claims less than three years old. Submitting a void or replacement claim can be done so by using the associated claim frequency code and transaction control number as listed on this slide. Next slide. Overpayment or credit balances. Claims that are more than three years old will need to be corrected using our payment adjustment request form located in our form section of our website. One form is required for claim. All required fields must be appropriately filled out or it will be returned to the provider. Checks along with the form can be submitted to the addresses listed here. Next slide. Medicaid's timely filing is one year from the date of service for new claims. Corrected claims can be submitted up to three years from the date of service. However, no additional funds will be reimbursed. In the case of Medicare crossovers, all claims and adjustments must be received within six months of the Medicare decision. The from date on a claim is used to determine the timely, with the exception of institutional claims, where the through date of service is used to determine time. Next slide. Grievances, appeals, and hearings. States are required to have a fair hearing system that complies with the provisions of 42 CFR 431 subpart E. The department's hearing procedure are described in Utah Administrative Code R410-14. This list offers the action that a hearing can be requested. Hearing must be filed within 30 calendar days from the date of denial. Next slide. Oh. Managed care entities are also required to have a grievance and appeals system. If a managed care entity makes an adverse benefit determination, also referred to as ABD, they must send notice of the determination and explain to the provider how to request an appeal. An appeal request must be filed with the managed care within 60 calendar days from the date of the notice of the ABD. If the appeal decision is adverse, a state fair hearing with the Medicaid agency may then be requested. A hearing must be requested within 120 calendar days from the date of the managed care notice. 
A grievance is an expression of dissatisfaction about any matter other than ABD. Grievances may be filed with the managed care plan at any time. Managed care must address the grievance within 90 calendar days from the date the grievance is received. Next slide. As a reminder, our Medicaid forms can be found on our website by selecting providers, provider resources and information, forms, provider form directory, and here you'll find a list of all forms for Utah Medicaid. Next slide. Record keeping. Utah Department of Health follows the provisions of the Government Records Access and Management Act, also known as GRAMA. Medicaid, provides, Medicaid providers must comply with all disclosure requirements in 42 CFR 455 subpart B. All providers must comply with the following rules regarding records noted in section one of our manuals. Providers are required to maintain accurate clinical records and are subject to audits in which findings could result in the recoupment of payment. It is the provider's responsibility to maintain accurate clinical records as listed below. Next slide. Utah Medicaid Provider Training Center can be located on our website. We offer on-demand videos for instruction and training on varied subjects. Next slide. Electronic visit verification. Beginning July 1st, 2021, all providers of personal care services in Medicaid must be able to demonstrate compliance with EVV requirements found in the 21st Century Cures Act. Provider of home health services will have until July, excuse me, have until January 1st, 2023 to comply with EVV requirements. Additional information for EVV can be found on our website at the link provided below. And this concludes the Medicaid information and resources portion of our presentation. Are there any questions before I turn the time over to Suzanne with BHPA? Let's see. I believe we do have some questions in the chat, Tiffany. Yes. Where would I find the CPT code H0020? We have an OTP clinic and are looking for dosing CPT in the manual. Um. Okay. Uh, Jimmy, we can do some research on that and get back to you. Can you leave? Um, an email. Or you can actually email me. Oh, perfect. Okay, thank you. Okay, will there be a provider type added for BCBAs? I think we'll have to get back to you on that when we have a representative from provider enrollment with us, please just leave us uh, your email and we can get back to you. Um, so is there a way to search all MIBs or do we just need to go into each one individually? We actually do have a search um, button at the top right hand side of our website. You can type in um, keywords or um, procedure codes, um, anything like that, and it should pull up all of the history that involved those codes or those specific search terms.
Will it be possible to exempt all co-pays for any services to all clients in foster care? I thought they were exempt from co-pays. I believe with full traditional Medicaid, they are exempt from co-pays. Yeah. So that would pertain to the foster kids as well. Oh, they are not. Can you... Oh. Will, would you mind giving us or sending us a, an ID so that we can take a look and find out why they are not um, and we can get back to you? Why not all Medicaid plans covered behavioral coverage? Um, Dave, is that something you can touch on? I'm not quite sure I understand the question. I mean, every Medicaid member has behavioral health coverage. Um, so sometimes they'll have an ACO and a PMHP. So everybody does have that coverage, just not some plans are, are physical health specific. Some plans are behavioral health specific, but everybody does have that coverage. Okay, thank you. Let's see here. Do visit verifications apply to ABA? I believe they do. You can go ahead and send all of your questions to my email and then I can divvy them out to who they pertain to. Uh, my email is estall, E-S-T-A-H-L, at utah.gov. There you go. Thank you, Tiffany. Can you give us the example of what we need to identify Medicaid patients again, please? As far as the eligibility lookup tool, I'm going to assume that's the question. Um, you need the ID number, name and date of birth, or social. ACO has told us to build a state for the ACO has told us to build a state for COVID vaccines, but then the state denies it as another payer. How do we bill for these? For the COVID vaccines, they are a carve out to Utah Medicaid or fee for service Medicaid. Um, a lot of times, I believe Melanie Hoyt can jump in on this question. We are working on programming to um, override the ACO so that it's not looking at that. Um, otherwise, you will have to call customer service and we can go ahead and force those claims through. Yeah, so um, hi, my name is Melanie. Um, that is true and what you have said. Um, we did have just a very recent system discrepancy. Um, whereas um, that COVID vaccine was not being carved out from the ACO edit. Um, therefore, it was denying the payment, but claims are going through. Um, and so please, if you have any outstanding claims um, today, please resubmit those. Um, we did try and catch them all. Um, so maybe check your remits to see if that claim has been reprocessed and the account is in good standing. Um, but otherwise, if it is not, please resubmit your claim and um, watch for that claim. And if you have any issues, please give our customer service uh, unit a call so they can give us a heads up. Okay, does Medicaid pay for IV pharmacy charges when they do not have a Medicare D plan? I believe we'll have to reach out to pharmacy policy on that. They actually will be presenting shortly as well. 
Hi, this is Dana with the pharmacy team. Um, as far as I know, we do pay for um, them as long as they don't have any Medicare coverage. Um, if they do, um, we might have to verify that to see if they are eligible for a, D, a Part D plan. If you have like any member um, specific um, questions, you can email it to us and we can look into it further for you. Thank you, Dana. Um, Luciana, can you send an email to Emily with your question? We can take a look at that for you and get back to you. Sure, no problem. Uh, I just need the email to send that question to. Okay. Um, we are a substance abuse facility, which CPT codes would we use? We have a residential and outpatient facility. The outpatient does IOP and day treatment. Um, Carolyn, I think sending an email to Dave, he can actually uh, help you with that question. I'll, I'll also say, Carolyn, if you get into the provider manuals and look up the Rehabilitative Mental Health and Substance Use Disorder Services Manual, it's quite a mouthful. It goes through all the covered codes for IOP and uh, all, the, well, all the behavioral health codes. Perfect. And then U of U is not offering behavioral coverage. They are asking the provider to enroll as a behavioral provider separate. I don't know if there's enough information in that question. I don't know what, what they mean by U of U. I mean, that's a, quite a broad <laughs> entity. Providers, health plan. Uh, it may be easier just to email me separately on that one. Okay, so it looks like you guys have a lot of questions. Um, if we can go ahead and get the rest of the questions we weren't able to get to over to Emily, I'm gonna put her email in the chat again. Um, if you can get those over, we can actually get those divvied up for you guys and you'll get a response here shortly. And with that, I'm actually gonna turn over the time to Suzanne uh, with BHPA. So hello, this is the updates for the Bureau of Healthcare Policy and Authorization Medical Policy Team. So uh, the Bureau of Healthcare Policy and Authorization Medical Policy Team is tasked with overseeing more than 20 programs, including medical, dental, vision, transportation, and DMHF services, to name a few. Some of the team functions include researching, developing, and advising on medical policy coverage and limitations. We translate federal and state regulations and policy into clear guidelines for providers, members, and internal stakeholders. We also research and respond to internal and external questions. Next slide. This hierarchy is the legal framework that governs the Medicaid program, starting with the CFR, the Code of Federal Regulations, moving through the state plan, administrative rule, Next slide. The Medicaid provider manuals, the lookup tool or the coverage and reimbursement lookup tool, uh, forms, all Medicaid documentation uh, or documents authorized for specific processes, and the MIBs, the Medicaid information bulletins. Next. The Bureau of Healthcare Policy and Authorization uh, medical policy team continues to make changes to our dedicated provider manuals throughout the year. These manuals contain coverage policy and instructional information, and any changes or updates are det detailed in the quarterly or interim MIB articles. We encourage providers to become familiar with all manuals, MIBs, and administrative rules, as they all contain coverage policy. Provider manuals contain policy related, to, uh, policy -related information as well as operational information. These manuals are usually updated on a quarterly basis if the updates are needed. Administrative rules contain policy-related information. When the rules are updated, they go through a process which includes a public comment period of 30 days. This is the time that providers have to comment on the information contained in the rules. 
along with the manuals, MIBs, and administrative rules are forms and coverage and reimbursement code lookup that also contain Medicaid policy. Next. So what's new in Medicaid policy? Next slide. Uh, effective 1-1 one, one of 2021, TAM SUD members, uh, dental services are available to the targeted adult Medicaid or TAM members who are actively receiving treatment in a substance use disorder treatment program or SUD program. TAM members ages 19 to 20 are eligible for EPSIT dental benefits regardless of the SUD treatment status as of 1-1 one, one of 2020. Next. Uh, some dental benefit updates. In order to be reimbursed, providers may now report completion of denture services by reporting the information listed on this slide. Providers may still be reimbursed for the entire service even when the member has lost eligibility during the denture process. Next. Sedation, uh, the sedation and general anesthesia policy has been updated effective 8-1 of 2020. The policy now aligns with the standards of care authorized or outlined, excuse me, in the American Dental Association and the American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry guidelines. Providers must abide by the ADA and AAPD guidelines when performing sedation related to dental services. The submitted documentation must reflect adherence to these guidelines and must show there was no other equally effective, more conservative, and less costly level of sedation suitable for the member. Next. Effective 5-1-2021, the Utah Medicaid policy surrounding urine drug testing was updated to align with the ASAM guidelines that encourage individualized, medically necessary testing with more frequent testing early in recovery and less frequent as the member becomes more stable in the recovery process. Next, the telehealth policy updates. The telehealth policy has been updated to include coverage of medically necessary non-experimental and cost-effective services provided via telehealth. This update includes no geographical restrictions for telehealth services. These communications may occur through interactive audio or video transmissions. They can be provided between a member and a distant site provider from any appropriate location. The following telephonic evaluation and management codes listed are opened, were opened, excuse me, on 4-1-2021 to physicians and other qualified healthcare providers. Those codes are listed there. Telehealth billing requirements. When billing telehealth services, the provider must indicate the place of service O2 on the CMS 1500 claim form, along with the services usual billing codes. For the UB04 institutional claims, providers must append the GT modifier, along with the services usual billing code. So uh, note there, services provided via telehealth have the same service thresholds, authorization requirements, and reimbursement rates as services delivered via face-to-face. -face. Next, teledentistry updates. Providers must report D9995 on a separate line of the claim in addition to one of the three dental codes listed. Of note, the teledentistry code D9995 will be reimbursed at $0 and will be used for tracking purposes only. Rates for approved teledentistry services are the same as rates for the in-person dental service. Next. Out-of-state transportation. The documentation listed is required when requesting out-of-state trans uh, transportation. The updated information is underlined in this section. Providers must submit the out-of-state transportation request form, a letter of medical necessity and supporting documents. Note, this letter should include why the treatment is not available in the state of Utah, a letter of acceptance from the accepting facility, a letter of acceptance from the accepting physician, treatment pro 
uh, proposal, confirmation that the accepting facility and physician are either enrolled or are willing to become enrolled with Utah Medicaid. Otherwise, they may need to negotiate with the reimbursement staff in order to be reimbursed for their services. Next, out-of-state transportation continued. All documents should be submitted with the original request for transportation and the travel uh, should not happen prior to the submittal and approval of the documentation. The forms are located on our website at the listed URL. So any questions? Uh, and due to the nature of many policy related questions, we ask that you submit your policy, um, your coverage policy questions regarding statewide provider training in this chat, um, along with your contact information so that the questions may be researched and re responded to appropriately. Um, if you have further coverage policy questions, uh, please submit them and, and please make sure that they're coverage policy related questions, not reimbursement related because we don't, um, we don't manage reimbursement. <laughs> Uh, the website or the email address is DMHF, that's Delta Mike Hotel Foxtrot Medical Policy at Utah.gov is the email address. And let me provide that in the chat right now. If you have any questions, please submit them to that email address so that proper research may be done. Um, I don't know if there's any questions. Uh, as Sharon stated in the chat, um, we are capturing all the questions and we'll follow up after the training. Uh, is there anything that's specifically related to medical policy right now? And the question for Ashley Valley Family Practice Billing, if you can get that over to Emily um, and maybe include some dates of service because we have had some changes for telehealth visits and COVID testing. Um, we can get you to the right manuals and things like that. So if you'll send that over to Emily, that'd be great. Yes, and Chris Santa, is that the, I provided the email address for the DMHF medical policy. Is, does that answer your, is that the email you're re requesting? Okay, thank you. Uh, and now I will turn the time over to Annette in uh, the, prior authorization team. Yes, thank you, Suzanne. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Annette Wynn. I am one of the supervisors um, on the prior authorization team in the Bureau of Health Care Policy and Authorization. And I will be going over the prior authorization portion of the training today. So um, the BHPA prior authorization or PA team um, this first slide here gives you an overview of who makes up the prior authorization team. As you can see, our staff has the perfect balance of professionals to get the job done. We have a great prior authorization team, and our staff makes up four teams, the outpatient DME team, the home health team, the behavioral health team, and the screen dental team. We all work very hard in reviewing prior authorization requests for Medicaid members while working with the medical policy team and providers. Next. This slide has um, some PA request form basics and all of the information on this slide is essential when starting the prior authorization process. Please go to the medical website um, excuse me, the Medicaid website, each time you need a PA request form or other form for the service being requested. By doing that, you will ensure that you are using the most up-to-date forms. Remember to fill in all required fields and submit them to the appropriate box. Anything that is marked with an asterisk is required. Remember, we only review requests for fee-for-service Medicaid members unless the request is for a carve-out service. Please provide the correct contact information, like a name and phone number of who we can talk to about a request if a question arises. And then with today's technology, please fill out the PA request forms electronically when possible. If you would like examples of PA forms that have already been filled out correctly, 
you may send an email to medicaidcriteria at utah.gov and we could send you those. And I will put that um, email address in the chat once I finish. Next, thank you. Prior authorization reminders. So the Utah Department of Health um, Medicaid website has a lot of useful tools and information to help with the prior authorization process. And several people have already commented about our website earlier. Um, the website includes areas where you can check the member's eligibility and you can look to see if the code requires prior authorization. So please be sure to visit the website at medicaid.utah.gov and become familiar with it. When sending in your prior authorization requests, please make sure that the documentation you send in is current and relevant with all required documents, forms, and or consents. Under the healthcare providers on the Medicaid website, there are, there are a lot of valuable resources this is where you can find the Medicaid manuals and MIBs, lookup tool notes, and our new online interqual transparency tool, among several other things. What's new in prior authorization? So we have recently updated the PA request forms to try to make them as similar as possible, but also to individualize them for the different programs. Each form also has a statement on them of what to do if the request requires an expedited review. You may have also noticed that we have changed the fax numbers and the email addresses. This was done in order to make it easier for the providers to know where to send in the request. We tried to streamline that for you guys. Um, we also added several new forms for different programs. They are listed on this slide. And we are in the process of making our correspondence letters more user-friendly. We ha already have a new return letter that we've, that we've been sending out for several months now. And the return letter is now attached to the fax or the email. And we are hoping that this will create better communication with providers. I also want to point out that the PA team strives for a seven-day turnaround time for reviewing requests. Next. So I saved the most exciting news for last, um, the new InterQual Transparency Tool. This tool is to assist providers in knowing what documentation is required for their prior authorization request. This tool should also be used in conjunction with other Medicaid policies and resources. This was av available as of July 1st, 2021. And providers do need to register for the transparency tool then they will be able to sign in and access the tool to view interqual criteria for many of the different services. Not all of our programs use interqual criteria, but this is a great resource for all of the programs that do. And then the next slide is just if you have any questions and answers. So I would just like to open up the time for that. Um, I will also include um, the email address I talked about for the criteria. And um, you can actually send anything to that email address if you have questions about codes or, um, you know, any kind of prior authorizations questions on how to do things. Um, that is, that email um, box is watched by me and the other supervisor. And we try to answer that within a few days. So. I'm just going to put that in the chat and then we'll look at any questions you guys have. Thanks, Annette. I, I did want to add that I do get an, a weekly update from prior authorization, um, which I forward to all of the customer service um, representatives. So if you're just calling in to find out uh, where they are on PA requests, we can certainly give you that information rather than um, bombarding prior authorization just to find out where they are on their reviewing. Um, so feel free to call customer service to find that out. Thank you, Emily. And we really appreciate you doing that for us. Um, it, it helps free up our time to do those the reviews. So Absolutely. Um, yeah, we have been a little bit behind, but we're getting closer to being completely caught up. So um, help from you guys definitely, you know, definitely saves us time. 
Um, I do see a couple things in the chat. Um, I, it's talking about emergency only coverage. When we treat a patient in the ER who has emergency only coverage and perform a service that requires PA, do we send documentation to the emergency program first or get the retro PA first or both at the same time? So the answer to that question is um, whenever a member has emergency only eligibility, all of those requests go to the emergency only program. We would not do anything in, in the prior authorization department. Um, in fact, if we do get those requests sent to us, it would be returned to you guys, just letting you know that it needs to go through the emergency only program. Um, and that kind of answers Brittany's question. I mean, those Kathy's and Brittany's kind of went hand in hand. And, How and many all of those would be retro uh, prior approved. Because yes. for that program, all documentation for the um, episode of care needs to be submitted to us so that they can be reviewed and the NEPA requirement would be done ret retroactively. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, let's see, the next question, how many days do you allow to submit a retro auth request? It is 90 days from the date of retro eligibility or if services are emergent. <clears throat> so we are actually, um, we just updated that. We have been going off of the 90 days and the 90 day rule was pretty much for everything. So um, it was 90 days from the day the patient became retro eligible or 90 days from the emergent services. Um, that has recently changed. As of August 1st, we have changed that to 180 days. Um, so, and that information was included in a MIB. Um, it was included in the July 2021 MIB, I believe. Um, I'd have to look that up to make sure, but it, it just recently came out that we're going to do 180 days instead of 90. And sorry, I've got to scroll back through the chat because it keeps on pushing it up. And just wanted to um, reiterate that the presentation will be was sent out with a reminder email. If you need to reach out to us and we need to um, send it to you individually, we can do that as well, Jean. Okay, thank you, Emily. Um, so, Chrysantha, I can see your question was next. It is, it, the question is, what is the usual PA time um, to get the answer for a non-emergency prior authorization? So, you know, unfortunately, that kind of varies with um, how busy the prior, authoriz prior authorization department gets. Um, you know, it depends on our staffing, the total amount of requests we have received. But just like I said in one of the slides previously, we strive for a seven day turnaround. Um, right now, I believe we are close to 11 days. Um, so we're getting very, very close to our goal of seven days. Um, and then, like I said, there are um, instructions on the Medicaid PA request form of how to deal with a request that needs to be reviewed um, emergently. So seven days is what we're going for. Um, the next question, does Medicaid do retro prior authorization and how many days does Medicaid allow to submit retro off? Um, so, you know, that actually varies by different programs. The best thing that you could probably do um, to get that answer answered correctly or that question answered correctly is to go ahead and send an email to that Medicaid criteria email that I put in the chat um, and then let me know what program you're asking about because things are a little bit different for the different programs. Um, then Jean for SNF for high cost meds how do we get this carve out and or carved out and or covered? Um, so anything to do with medications, I'm going to let Dana actually handle that because she is going to be talking about the pharmacy program. She's going to be after me. So as soon as we get through some more questions, then um, we can go through that. Oh, and it looks like, oh, let's see. Sharon was answering something different. If there is a stat PA when the provider wants to avoid 
is there a stat PA when the provider wants to avoid sending patients to the ER? Um, so Karen, the answer to that question, you know, you can certainly send in a prior authorization urgently. Um, there is a box that you would need to mark on the prior authorization request, and then you actually do need to call us and let us know that you sent it in and that it's urgent. Um, I don't want to say that we would want to avoid sending patients to the ER, because if a patient truly needs to be seen in the ER for, you know, something urgent, either a some type of a service like a, a surgery or something like that, or even just an imaging. Um, we do not want you guys to delay the care, um, but just keep in mind that the documentation does have to prove that it was a true emergency in order for that to be, um, you know, possibly retro PA. So, um, and can then, I interject something related to that, Annette? Yes, please. I'm sorry. This is Suzanne. Um, so for the emergency services program for non-citizens, and I just wanted to clarify this, if anything is performed that requires a PA, um, it would have to meet the emergent criteria of the program, be considered uh, the program um, criteria needs to be, will would be taken into consideration first. So, of course, this program, and I don't know if everybody knows this or not, but it does not cover things that are planned. So planned procedures that require PA would not be considered in this. The whatever's going on with the member or the patient would have to meet the emergent criteria first in order to be considered for a retro PA for something that requires a PA. So I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, that's all the questions that I can see in the chat right now for me, um, but I will be here throughout the rest of the presentation. So if you have further questions, you can leave them at the chat at the end. Um, you know, like people have said before, we're also capturing all of the questions and they will divvy them out to the different um, programs and people that need to address them. Or you can always send them to that Medicaid criteria email address that I put in the chat. So thank you so much for your time. And I'm going to now turn the um, time over to um, Dana to talk about the pharmacy program. Thank you. Hi, my name is Dana Boy. I'm a certified pharmacy technician with the Medicaid pharmacy program. Um, next. Our pharmacy team is comprised of clinical staff that ensure safe, appropriate, and cost-efficient use for medications for Utah's Medicaid population. We determine pharmacy program coverage, PA determinations for fee-for-service members, creates pharmacy policy in conjunction with DUR and PNT committees, and interacts with pharmacy providers, prescribers, and members. Pharmacy prior authorization and preferred drug list. Um, so since uh, the fee-for-service Utah Medicaid program and each of the managed care entities have their own preferred drug list or formulary and or um, PA coverage. Um, we just ask that you submit the request um, to the appropriate MCE if the medication is not carved out of the MCE benefit. So for Jean, who had a question earlier, it does need to be uh, carved out. Next. Um, throughout the training, there's going to be a few pharmacy PA scenarios that we hope will be helpful to you. Uh, the first one is a provider needs um, to request a PA for a member who is enrolled with a MCE. How do I know which PA requests are sent to fee-for-service Medicaid uh, versus um, the member's MC plan? And um, the following uh, list right here are select drug classes that are carved out from the MC for coverage and are covered by fee-for-service Medicaid. Um, so anti-anxiety drugs, anti-convulsant drugs, antidepressant, antipsychotic, um, ADHD stimulant drugs, hemophilia drugs, opioid use disorder treatments, and transplant immun immunosuppressive drugs. The Pharmacy prior authorization forms are reviewed by the clinical staff annually. In some cases, they may be reviewed more often than that. 
Um, for example, if the drug class gets reviewed in DUR committee or PNT committee before the annual date deadline. And in addition to our pharmacy PA forms, the PDL contains very valuable coverage and policy information as listed there. Next. Um, the next scenario is a PA has been denied, what are the next steps? So we always provide the denial reasons on the letter. Um, so please review those reasons. If it was denied for a non-preferred product, please consider switching to a preferred product. Um, if the request was denied due to lack of information, just resubmit the request with the needed information. And if neither of those could be satisfied, then the providers um, may submit a pre-hearing request uh, within 30 days to the administrative hearings unit. Diagnostic products, including diabetic supplies not listed on the PDL, are non-preferred and must be billed through the medical benefit as durable medical equipment um, or DME, and the PA form could be found on the website listed there, as well as the PDL. Uh, please note that not all pharmacy-related HCPCS codes are listed on the PDL. Um, we encourage Medicaid providers to verify coverage um, using the coverage and reimbursement lookup tool every time a service is rendered. And then also use the MDC crosswalk using the fee schedule download tool. What is retrospective DUR? Um, it's when the pharmacy staff utilizes communication tools such as motivational interviewing to promote and reinforce best practices in the delivery and administration of pharmacy benefits through um, review of claims data or other records. Uh, these outcome measures are derived from CMS guidelines um, as well as outlined by NCQA. And in the next few slides, we'd like to share with you the retrospective DR work that the pharmacy team has been working on. The Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, effective July 2020. Um, through the pharmacy point of sale system, there's going to be some edits. A PA will be required for children under four years of age and under six years of age for the following medications listed. Next. Antipsychotics in children pharmacy edits. Um, this is more of a review. Um, a PA will be needed for high dose limitations for members under 20 years of age, very young children under six, uh, for concurrent use of multiple antipsychotics and very high dose antipsychotics that exceed the recommendations listed on the package insert. Um, all uh, diagnosis codes will be required on all initial antipsychotic prescriptions for children, as well as monitoring of annual metabolic screening. Um, and from our pharmacy interventions, um, you can see that the uh, percentage of children receiving antipsychotics, the number of foster care members, and number of children receiving multiple antipsychotics um, fell. Hepatitis C medication adherence program is aimed at increasing treatment completion rates and cure of hepatitis C infection among fee-for-service members. The program started in April 2020, um, and you can see that our baseline adherence without the interventions in 2019 was 73%, but since our interventions, it has significantly increased, which we are super excited about. Um, antidepressant medication adherence program um, is aimed at improving antidepressant medication adherence uh, for uh, members who are di newly diagnosed uh, depression. And the clinical pharmacist conducts outreach to targeted Utah Medicaid fee-for-service members um, through motivational interviewing techniques to identify barriers to adherence address health literacy and create strategy for change. The pharmacist may also assist the member in ordering medication refills, finding a pharmacy that deliver uh, medications. Um, they also reach out to 
the member's mental health care provider to provide pertinent information such as member reported side effects to the antidepressant and uh, do follow-up phone calls to the member for continued medication adherence support. Pharmacy opioid interventions. Um, since October 2019, there's been 47% decrease in the number of fee-for-service members on morphine milligram equivalents greater than 90, a decrease of 17.8% uh, overall among all Medicaid members. Since April 2019, there's been a 15% decrease, uh, percent decrease in the number of fee-for-service members with concurrent opioid and benzodiazepine use, um, as well as we can continue to see declines through our interventions um, in both of the, these areas. And um, moving on into pharmacy policy update, effective 1-121, um, Utah Medicaid will limit the use of opioid medications in members who are also receiving medications to treat opioid use disorder or MAT. When a claim for an opioid medication is processed through the pharmacy point of sale system, um, the system will look to see if there's a medication uh, for MAT is processed within the last 45 days. If um, the system recognizes a claim, then it will reject um, and limit the opioid to a seven day supply or less. And if there's not one, then the opioid will process without the seven day limitation uh, with all quantity and policy limits still applied. And effective 3121, the opioid use disorder treatment drug class was updated on the PDL. So the oral buprenorphine and buprenorphine naloxone uh, products prior authorization form was also updated to reflect uh, approval criteria for quantity limits, dose limits, and non-preferred products. And one highlight is that we don't require a PA for single ingredient buprenorphine anymore with all quantity and policy limits applied to that as well. Pharmacy biosimilar policy update. The team will uh, contact the provider to switch to a preferred biosimilar product if a PA is received for a non-preferred reference product. And the proof of delivery requirement will be waived for a non-C2 um, C2 prescription. Effective 5-121, the CGMs are now covered through the pharmacy point of sale system with a prior authorization. And um, you can look at our PDL for a list of preferred products. For our continuation of care policy, this was updated to make exceptions for continuation of care for a non-preferred product because um, our current non-preferred policy requires that a member try and fail at least one preferred um, agent in the same drug class. However, those who are transitioning to Medicaid may have a rejected claim at the pharmacy for that. And um, so by updating this policy, we hope that uh, more members um, from other providers transitioning to us uh, will be able to get their medications. Our next PA scenario, the pharmacy has a rejection for PA required for Ozempic, which was preferred on Utah's PDL in the past. Why is it now required? The PDL is uh, updated monthly, um, so it is subject for change. If you look on our PDL, you'll see that Ozempic is listed as non-preferred um, as of 1121, and right above it, you'll see the list for our preferred uh, products. And as a note, the Ozempic was grandfathered due, the, due to the PDL update, so all claims after 4121 will require a PA. Next. Uh, switching to pharmacy services updates, um, after March 15th, 2021, the COVID-19 vaccine administration fees has been increased to $40. And effective 4121, a pharmacy point of sale claims for insulin pens may be billed for up to 140 day supply with a limit of one box for claims over 30 days in accordance with the FDA's recommendations. And the day supply on submitted claims should reflect the actual days 
that the medication will last or expire. ADHD stimulants edits in the pharmacy point of sale system um, are as follows. The, if the member is on three or more unique ADHD stimulant medications prescribed concurrently for at least 30 days in the last 45 days, a cross-class prescribing of ADHD stimulant medications from the amphetamine class and methylphenidate class for at least 30 days in the last 45 days for children under 18 years of age. Next. Pharmacy PA scenario. Um, the pharmacy has a rejection for a member who is 16 years old and is on an amphetamine and methylphenidate concurrently. What form does the provider need to submit? So the PA forms on our website are listed in alphabetical order, either by drug or drug class. So in this case, you won't find the PA under um, the name amphetamine or methylphenidate, but it will be under the ADHD stimulants. And we encourage you to visit and familiarize yourself with our website to find out more information regarding the Utah Medicaid Pharmacy Program. And then this slide contains um, contact information to a customer service, our medical policy, pharmacy, and prior authorization. And I can answer any questions regarding pharmacy at this time. And thank you, Andrew, for answering some of those questions to Jean. Looks like we have Karen and Fimia that have some questions. Do we want to start with Karen? Not sure if if you hear me, Karen. Um, you're on mute. Okay. How about we move to Femia, please? Hi. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I do have a question with regard to pharmacy. Is there a list of approved pharmacies um, that we can access? Um, as we're finding difficulty with a lot of the commercial. Um, pharmacies with uh, filling meds or certain uh, certain medications needing to go to certain pharmacies. So is there an approved list of pharmacies that our consumers can, so that we know how to direct our consumers to those appropriate pharmacies um, to retrieve their medications? Um, thank you for that question. So we currently do not have one. It's because that we don't restrict to any pharmacies, including specialty. So the, a member can go to any of them. So just to provide a scenario, we, for instance, have a medication at Walgreens, for instance, and Walgreens is saying because of, of because of the Medicaid, Medicaid requires this particular medication to be um, filled at a different pharmacy. Is that, um, could you speak more to that if that is the case? If it is a pharmacy issue, not necessarily a Medicaid issue, I would just like some clarification because it can be frustrating to our consumers when they can't access their medications because the pharmacy can't fill it for a perceived blockage in uh, reimbursement or something like that. Yeah, I understand. But Utah Medicaid, we don't restrict to a specific pharmacy. So if a pharmacy is giving you um, issues with that, it could uh, I'd probably reach out to clarify if it was other MCE. Um, programs that might be restricting to specific pharmacies, um, but we do not. So um, if you have specific member information, um, we can definitely look into that for you. Um, our Medicaid pharmacy email is the Medicaid pharmacy at utah.gov. And Femia, um, customer service does have a separate pharmacy line um, that those representatives can also, they work hand in hand with pharmacy policy uh, to look at the rejections and help with those questions. So they can certainly give customer service a call and we can get them um, to the right person or, or get with pharmacy policy to find out uh, what the 
what the answer is. Yes, exactly. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. Of course. All right. And with that, I will turn the time over to Elise with OIG. Thank you. For those that um, have not had your question answered, you can certainly email your uh, direct question to Pharmacy Policy and they can get, get with you. Uh, Rochelle needs some help. Rochelle, what was your question again? Andrea, I know you're on. Could you answer that for her? Yeah, so I would probably advise um, not having the patient sign a waiver. Um, in the event, I think, I'm not sure who presented it, but if you accept Medicaid payment, that's that's the payment for the service. Um, so it, I don't believe it would be in the member's best interest to have them sign a waiver to pay for the drug administered. Um, in the event that you are being um, underpaid for a drug, you can definitely reach out to the pharmacy team and we can direct you to the appropriate party. We do have contracts with Myers and Stauffer who manage certain pricing elements. And we can also explain to you the um, for the products that are not managed by Myers and Stauffer um, for MAC pricing, we can explain to you the pricing logic and how it's updated and where to find it and all of that information. So um, I would not encourage you to have a patient sign a waiver to administer the drug product. Thank you, Andrea. Sure. Okay, we'll go ahead and turn the time over to uh, OIG. Looks like we're having. Let me turn up. I'm going to turn up my volume just a little bit. Does that help at all? That's great. Thank you. Okay. Let me start again. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Elise Knapper. Good morning. I'm the UOIG's policy analyst and trainer. As I'm sure you're all aware, the statewide provider training changed a little bit this year. Instead of an in depth look at each program area, the focus this year has been on what's changed and what's new. And the upside is that the training today has been shorter than it's been in years past. Unfortunately, it also means that our office didn't feel like we had enough time to deliver an effective training and cover all of the topics that we needed to. So this year, I'm gonna spend a few minutes just going over some very high level information about who we are and what we do. And then I'll share some valuable resources that can assist you in your compliance efforts. Also, at the end of the overview today, I'm going to share some information about how to register for our upcoming fraud, waste, and abuse trainings, or how to request that we come out to your organization, either in person or virtually, and deliver a training that is geared specifically towards your organization. Next slide. The Utah Office of Inspector General was formed in 2011 as an independent office. What that means is that the office is not under the supervision of nor does it take direction from any other departments within the state of Utah. Gene Cottrell is Utah's Inspector General. He's the second person to be appointed to the position and he is currently in his second appointment. Next slide. Our office's goal is to eliminate Medicaid fraud, abuse, and waste. Next slide. We work to achieve our goal by following our mission, which is to protect taxpayer dollars by identifying fraud, abuse, and waste risks and vulnerabilities in the state Medicaid program, and then by taking action to mitigate or eliminate those risks. And we do this in two key ways. One is proactive, where we look at potential policy or procedural opportunities within the program. This is the direction that CMS is recommended. And by identifying opportunities to clarify policies or refine procedures, and then proactively addressing them, it helps contribute to the avoidance of a pay and chase model of business. We feel that this is important because a pay and chase model is largely inefficient. It can lead to a lot of waste within the program. So ideally issues would be identified prior to actually becoming issues. 
which would save both the UOIG and Medicaid the time, effort, and resources needed to resolve them after the fact. The other way that we work toward our goal is by looking at causes of improper payments, such as maybe examining claims history to differentiate between honest mistakes and intentional errors. This is obviously a more responsive approach, but it's also an important component of identifying any fraud, waste, or abuse that could be occurring within the program. Next slide. So the UOIG has oversight over anywhere that Medicaid dollars go. If you look at the radial cluster or the chart here on this slide, you can see just how large that universe is. We look at program funding and sources of revenue from federal and state and county dollars to grants. We look at the divisions and the departments who have responsibility to manage and oversee Medicaid programs. We look at the waivers, we look at PRISM, and we look at the providers who are contracted to provide services to Medicaid recipients. Now, although we have oversight over the entire universe that you see here, the UOIG cannot prosecute criminal conduct. So for that, we work with MFUKU or the Medicaid Fraud Control Unit. Next slide. Just to put this into context, Let's look at some really high level metrics for the last couple of years. Utah Medicaid reports that in fiscal year 2019, total Medicaid expenditures were $2.8 billion with over 17 million claims or capitations paid. And then in fiscal year 2020, those numbers climbed to 3.3 billion in expenditures and just over $18.3 million in claims or capitations. So as you can see, it's a pretty substantial program but with that comes some inherent risk for potential fraud, waste, or abuse. Next slide. The UIG wants to be able to gauge our effectiveness as good stewards of taxpayer resources. So we have identified a number of KPIs or metrics that we use as a barometer to sort of um, see what we're doing with our work and to see if we are being good stewards of taxpayer resources. Since the state legislature created our office in 2011, we have recouped over $74 million. So the return on investment to taxpayers is pretty high. We calculate three return on investment numbers. We look at recovery, cost avoidance, and then an overall return on investment. In 2019, our ROI for recoveries was just over 147%. Our ROI for cost avoidance was 612%. And our total return on investment for taxpayers was 760%. And although last year was something of an anomaly due to COVID, our ROI for recoveries was 390%. The ROI for cost avoidance was 809%. And the total return on investment for taxpayers was just over 1,199%. So Speaking of recoveries, if you look at the recovery rates for the last few years on this chart, you're going to see a clear trend. And that is that cost avoidance is a very effective way for us to safeguard taxpayer resources. As a result, we place very strong emphasis on cost avoidance. Cost avoidance, for those of you who aren't familiar with the term, is best described as a change in behavior. That might be a change in provider billing behaviors or possibly in Medicaid implementing a policy or um, implementing a recommendation that we made. But it's some change in behavior that is attributable to our office and then results in quantifiable savings to the Medicaid program. And we calculate cost avoidance by observing a trend, both prior to a project and then again at the completion of a project. We compare the average difference in billing behavior prior to and after completion, and then we project the associated savings out over five years. Our actual model for cost avoidance is being adopted by other OIGs in other states around the country, which speaks very highly of Dr. Vanus's work. He's our lead data scientist, if you're not familiar with him. And it tells us that we're on the right track. It also tells us that um, cost avoidance is efficient. And um, unlike recoupment, as its name suggests, it's not part of the pay and chase model of business because recoupment is pay and chase. Recoupment is where Medicaid has already paid out those monies. And now we have to go and try to chase them down and attempt to recover them when they were improperly paid. Cost avoidance, however, prevents those resources from being inappropriately used or wasted in the first place. Next slide. So our office is organizationally divided into three distinct program areas. 
The first is our operations or mission support team. This is the group that you'd contact regarding general operations or for records requests or for hearings. This is also the team that our data scientists work on, and they examine the Medicaid claims universe for trends, for potential fraud schemes, um, and also for outliers in the data. Next, we have the audit team. The auditors follow a very strict audit process with an identified audit plan and stated objectives. And the audits must adhere to quality standards that are set by the United States Government Accountability Office, the Federal Offices of Inspector General, and the Association of Inspectors General. And then last but not least, we have our program integrity team. The PI unit works a little more closely with Medicaid just as a result of their program integrity responsibilities. They also receive complaints from the media, from the public, maybe from individuals who have reviewed their explanation of benefits, really from all types of sources. They have several nurse investigators who review medical records, and they're also involved in the recruitment and hearing processes. Next slide. That brings us to reporting. If you have any reason to suspect fraud, waste, or abuse, Utah code mandates that you report it to the Utah Office of Inspector General. You may additionally report suspected fraud directly to Mifuku. And because each healthcare organization and each state and local government have their own fraud detection policies, you may also be asked to report to them as well in accordance with your employer's um, policies. Next slide. Uh, this brings us to how to report to us. So you can report suspected fraud, waste, or abuse directly to our office in a couple of different ways. So you can call our hotline, or you can email a referral form to us at mpi at utah.gov, or you can go to our website and fill out um, a form under the Report Fraud tab, and I think it's in the upper left corner of the landing page. Also, at the conclusion of the training today, I'll email a copy of our referral forms to everybody who was registered for the training. Speaking of making a referral, as a referent, you have the ability to request to remain anonymous. If you request to remain anonymous, we will absolutely honor that request. That said, providing us with your name and contact information is sometimes crucial to our ability to pursue a lead. So for example, if a tip comes in that involves a person maybe with a very common name, and there is a list of potential individuals that the tip could be about, it's very helpful for us to be able to reach out to the referent and ask for some additional identifying information, maybe the person's age or where they live. But being able to narrow down that list of potentially involved individuals sometimes helps us enormously. It's also important to note that if you do choose to share your contact information, we will keep that information strictly confidential. It's not something that we typically share outside of the office. In fact, the only time we will ever release your contact information outside of our office is if a criminal case necessitates it or a court order compels us to do so. And in the event of criminal prosecution, we would only share your contact information with Mafuku, who also maintain their very own strict confidentiality policies. Next slide. So some compliance, resource, uh, compliance resources for you. We're often asked questions about what is allowable. And actually, this is probably true of most of the other trainers here today. I know that we all welcome those questions. Um, but it's not always possible or appropriate for us to answer the questions immediately. And that's because Medicaid programs and policies are incredibly nuanced. I'm sure you all know that. Whether or not something is allowable can change based upon the Medicaid program or the waiver in question. Um, it can change based upon the age of the Medicaid beneficiary or some other demographic information about the beneficiary. It can change based upon the date of service and the policy that was in place at the time of that service. Or it could even change based upon the existence of a prior authorization approval if one was required. So we also want to ensure that when we are um, when we're giving information out, that we're making very consistent recommendations. We want to be sure that we're providing very consistent guidance. So it's quite possible that we may take a moment to research your questions before we provide you with our official opinion. So this brings me to what is probably the most um, maybe helpful or important compliance tip that I can offer. And that's just to keep in mind, Medicaid policies and regulations change frequently. This last year with COVID was a really good example of that. At one point, federal regulations and the amended 1135 waivers 
sometimes changed daily. And that resulted in, like, for example, telehealth regulations that also sometimes change daily. As Tiffany mentioned earlier, your best resources for Utah Medicaid policy are going to be the MIBs, the Medicaid Information Bulletins, the Provider Manuals, and Utah Administrative Rules. So I would strongly recommend that you go to the Utah Medicaid website and sign up to receive notification when a new MIB is released because those publications are going to contain some really important information for you about specific policy changes. And then because Utah Medicaid is slowly moving program policy from provider manuals into Utah administrative rules, I'd also recommend that you research policy located in Medicaid's admin rules. The most pertinent, the most pertinent I'm sorry, I can't speak this morning, um, can be found under Title 414. And there are a couple of places that you can go to research those. Admin rules used to be located at rules.utah.gov. It still lists all of the historic rules, but it's not being updated any longer. Instead, new rules are now available at adminrules.utah.gov. And current rules are slowly being moved over to the new site as well. Then in addition, the Utah Medicaid State Bulletin publishes notices about proposed rule changes, emergency 120-day rules, five-year rule reviews, and other executive branch notices. So I would recommend, at least until the migration from the old site to the new site is complete, that you probably search all three sites just to be sure that you're finding what you're looking for. Some additional federal resources also include CFR, USC, CMS, and the HHS OIG who issue advisory opinions and compliance guidance. Next slide. That brings me to training. So in keeping with the duties and powers of our office, we provide training to government employees, providers, and their staff members, and to key community partners and stakeholders. We offer an approximate 50 minute long training on fraud, waste, and abuse that assists providers in educating their staff about all of the requirements for providers that are outlined in the Federal False Claims Act, the Deficit Reduction Act, and in many of your contractual obligations. It also covers topics such as responding to the UOIG records requests, uh, reporting to our office, changes resulting from COVID, and information about the recent changes to the ACO contracts, including the new take-back processes. We've actually got two of them scheduled for next month. One is on September 8th and one is on September 16th. If you're interested in attending, there's a QR code on this slide and in your slide deck. If you have your smartphone handy, you can capture it right now. It'll take you directly to the registration page. Your slide deck also includes a hyperlink and the website of the registration page or you can register by emailing alexfranco at utah.gov, and I'll plug that information into the chat in just a moment. And then in addition to our fraud, waste, and abuse training, we're also available to provide training directly to your organization. And then we can tailor that to your organization um, as appropriate so that each audience um, has their particular training needs met. If you'd like to request training content for your organization, please email me directly at enapper at utah.gov. And again, I'll plug that into the chat. Next slide, please. And that brings us to our contact information. So I've included the contact of some of UOIG's management. They are very responsive. They welcome any questions that you may have. And I can also provide these if you're interested or not prepared to write them down. They're in your slide deck as well. Um, please feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to send them to you. Any questions? Next slide. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of the overview. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I hope that I'll see some of you at our upcoming trainings next month. But for now, I'm gonna turn it back over to Emily and we'll open it up to the Q&A section. Thank you, Elise. Uh, looks like we do have a few questions. Let me just open up my chat again. Okay, so. Um, Linda writes, I have a patient's old Medicaid payments trying to be recouped by the OIG against his brother's insurance. I've submitted a case to the OIG, but the case manager assigned will not return any phone calls. 
family is getting letters from investors and insurance, what can we do? Linda, will you reach out to me, send me an email directly with that information and I'll look into it and find out what's going on with the case and who's over it. Um, Carla says, will you be sending out the recorded version so that I'm interested in receiving it? Do you mean my recorded version or the recorded version today? I believe the the entire, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, but I believe this entire thing will be published on Utah Medicaid's website. Is that correct? Uh, Sharon, um, I'll reach out to Sharon for that. I believe it will, yes. I, I think that's, yeah, I think she said that was the plan. Yes. Hi, everybody. Yes, this is being recorded, and we will post this recording and the training on the 25th on our Medicaid website. Um, they probably will not be posted on the website until later this month. Um, but I can send out an email to everyone who registered to let them know it is on our website. So thank you for that question. Thanks, Sharon. Um, I'm just scrolling through to see if I have any other questions pertaining to us specifically. It looks like there's just a lot of commentary and thank yous back and forth. Did anybody else have any questions specifically for us or should we open it up to the Q&A session? Okay, that's all yours, Emily. All right, um, is there anyone that, <clears throat> excuse me, um, needs a question answered right now? Uh, Luciana, you can email me at estall at utah.gov. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm having a hard time seeing the chat. So if you need to unmute yourself to ask me a question, feel free to do so. I am too. It shrunk hugely. It looks like that one might be for us finding the result after reporting. If so, um, definitely reach out to me and let me know. I can look up a particular case and let you know what's going on at that point. We get a lot of referrals. Um, so we don't typically reach out to the referent afterwards to update them, but if it's something that it's ongoing or that you're interested in knowing about, reach out to us and where appropriate, we can comment. Sometimes um, just based upon mm -hmm. the merits mm -hmm. of an investigation or a case, it's, it's not something that is um, resolved instantly. Sometimes it, it takes a little bit of time. So there is also a delay there. And Elise, that question, I can read it off to you. Um, it does say, is there a way to find out the results of any providers that were reported to OIG by the one who reported the fraud? And then the follow-up was finding the result after, mm -hmm. after reporting. Again, it, it depends on the particular case um, and what you're asking. So in instances where maybe the the situation involved fraud, it could result in the provider being added to the list of excluded individuals. So that's something you can definitely look up, the, um, the LEIE, and I can provide you with that link if you want to send me the information about the specific case, I can look into that as well. I'm just not sure what criteria you're looking for in terms of your particular case. Is it in general? Is it, um, are you looking for maybe a metric where you can go and look up a particular referral that you've made? Um, it's a provider that was reported because of the twice uh, fraud. Uh, it, it's like a seem like a fraud activity, which is kind of proven to them. So wondering if, you know, because some of my foster parents are still going to that particular provider. So we're trying to avoid it, but they're still being, they're still putting services. Yeah, definitely um, send me an email at the end of this and let's look into your particular situation, okay? Okay, sounds great. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, will you send it your email too, please? I will. I'll add it again now. Thanks. Thank you. Rochelle, do you have a question? Okay. Britt, I know you do. Did I mute you? 
Did that help at all? Um, it's telling me I can't unmute you, so I don't. Yes, that's correct. We don't have the ability to unmute anybody. So if so, either provide your question in the chat or unmute. Brittany, um, when it comes to the non covered days and covered days, is that let me look in the provider. Um, let me get back to you. I have your email. Let's talk after this meeting or you can give me a call. I think you have my direct line. I want to say it's in the. I, I cannot remember what it's called, but we'll we'll get you that answer today or give me a call here shortly and we can talk. Brittany, have you looked in the companion guides in medicaid.utah.gov? I believe it says, yeah, okay, give me a call. Anyone else that we can address our question now before we end? Again, feel free to reach out to me um, if it's a basic question that customer service can help you with. Give us a call. Um, I did want to let you know we are shorthanded about five texts right now. Um, just be patient with us. We're trying to answer the phone calls as fast and efficiently as we can. Um, but if you, like I said, if you want to email me, then I can certainly start on your questions. Thank you guys for being here. Uh, I think we can go ahead and end this. Uh, I think that all the presenters sent out the uh, needed emails for direct questions. All right, thank you guys so much. Have a great day.